Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified, Makia Video Productions, and Melly Productions, with additional support from the Blue Light Grill and Raw Bar, working closely with local farms, and Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture. So here we are for another day of Meet the Farmer TV, but today is a special day. This is the day before an historic inauguration where our president-elect has asked us each to donate a day of service. So we're gonna have Nancy Helgren go and find out from Carol Ann Friedman how she has founded Friends of Farmers. They're gonna take 40 volunteers and go and help a local farmer. Take it away, Nancy. Thanks, Michael. Today I'm here with Carol Ann Friedman, who organized a very special event in response to the inaugural committee's request for a day of citizen participation of national service. Can you tell us more about today? We had about 40 people from our area, adults and um, all the way down to fifth and sixth graders, come and volunteer to help local farmers with winter chores, which for most farmers are cleaning up and building compost, um, things like that. These were farmers who are either starting new farming ventures or farmers, one of the farmers we saw today had had a bad fire and her, her farm hadn't really recovered. But I was trying to use it as a way of um, getting people to think about the challenges of farming in Central Virginia and how really difficult farming is and to think about ways that we can bless the hands that feed us. Um, we're so fortunate in this area to have access to really high quality um, local food and not every place in this nation has it but we do and so um, I wanted people to meet these farmers to see their farms and to give back a little bit. It seems like you have a great deal of interest in the welfare of these farmers um, do you have plans for helping them in the future? Yeah, I, um, I started eating locally six or seven years ago um, with a milk share. And my farmers have started to teach me all about food and community and the land and the soil and just the critical web of relationships between consumers and farmers and the environment and energy and health. And as I'm as I'm thinking more about this over the last several years and, and becoming involved with more and more farms, what I'm noticing is that while um, our area provides, we're, we're responding to the desire for people to eat locally with like our eat, our eat Local group, and that's very consumer driven, and we're responding to the need for um, a political presence in Richmond through VICFA um, and other organizations. What I haven't seen is people who are responding directly to the immediate um, pressing needs of farmers themselves. And my farmers are constantly in a state of, you know, either semi-crisis or uh, they live hand to mouth. These are people who work hard all the time and they don't have any um, safety net. They don't have a government waiting to kind of buy them you know, buy their crops if nobody wants them and they don't have anybody who's going to pay them for a failed year. These are small farmers who don't have um, any of the protections that a lot of Americans associate with farming. So as a result, some of my farmers have had years where they wonder if they're going to be able to survive for the next year. And my family and I get the vast majority of our food, about three quarters of our food from local farmers. And if they disappear, I don't eat. <laughs> so I'm, I've been starting to think about, you know, what do I really need to offer these farmers to make sure that they stay in business and that they feel um, the kind of the spiritual, the communal, the financial support of the people they're feeding. And so um, I used today as an um, opportunity to introduce people to the idea of this new nonprofit organization called Friends of Farmers. And our mission is basically to um, provide a communal safety net and um, uh, financial and practical resources and regular service opportunities um, for people who want to you know, help undergird farms in our region. What a wonderful 
idea, what a wonderful way to be involved in the community. It seems like everyone wins, you know, the consumers, the farmers, the land, mm -hmm. the community. Yeah, Virginia, um, we were heavy tobacco farmers for a long time, and um, a lot of people are no longer farming in that way. Um, we're losing farms daily, and until we make um, sustainable farming a, a financially viable option, we'll continue to lose farms. Um, farmers in our district pay land use taxes that they shouldn't be paying. I mean, if they're farming, in my opinion, they should get big tax breaks. Um, they are really subject to, you know, wind and weather and then there's the, the huge problem of cheap food. I mean, as long as cheap food is available at the grocery store, why are people going to pay, you know, fair prices for food that comes locally? So one of my goals with Friends of Farmers is also to educate and to raise awareness um, about the, really, the high cost of cheap food to our health, to our environment, to our energy systems, just to our communities, and to help people understand how, at least in Central Virginia, eating locally and seasonally is a viable option. It takes some forethought and some planning, but I've even um, been in contact with some folks who might have a community kitchen available so that we can have um, seminars on how to put food by, um, where we can teach people how to think kind of long-term about what to do with the abundance of food we have in our region during the growing months to get themselves through the winter. And, um, you know, really, I, I believe very strongly that um, our food system in this country is broken and that one of the ways that um, our country is going to recover from these health, energy, environmental, economic issues is to completely reform the way that we think about food and the way that we eat. And, I, and I've seen my involvement with the Obama campaign over the last year has shown me the power of grassroots activism. And so I honestly think that if this change occurs, it's going to be a change that begins at the grassroots level and rises up. Um, and the Obama team has been really responsive to some of our concerns. The energy and environmental team you know, have, has responded to us kind of directly about our concerns about food. So you know, this is the next step. And I hope to see Friends of Farmers or ideas like it spread out through the nation where farmers in this country, small farmers, will really feel like somebody's got their back. Nice. You know, it occurs to me hearing you talk that we have for so many years been taught to turn over to someone else something to do, whereas this we're, we're taking the responsibility back. Yeah. You know, uh, if people learn how to can, to put food mm -hmm. aside, to uh, support their local farmers, to grow maybe some of their own food. W right. What a wonderful gift. It really shifts. It's a shift in awareness. Um, back in, you know, even in my kind of grandparents' day, if a, if a local farmer had a catastrophe, everybody came together to help because this is where our food comes from. Now if a local farmer fails, we think, well, we can go to the grocery store and buy broccoli. Well, um, my commitment to eating locally and the commitment that I think more and more people in this region are starting to share is that if my farmer doesn't farm, I don't get broccoli. I mean, in order for me to eat the foods that I love, I have to figure out how to grow them in my food shed because it's it is just unsustainable to eat food any other way. And so, you know, I think it, it's a shift in consciousness that really creates community bonds and a connection, a spiritual connection, a physical connection to the land, to seasons, um, that a lot of us, you know, in my generation grew up without. And I've, uh, my farmers have enriched my life more than anything else I've known in the past, you know, 20 years. They've completely changed the way that I am sort of in the world and in the community. And they're my heroes, you know, <laughs> so I'll do cool. whatever it takes to keep them around. So how has your life changed since you've met these farmers and established uh, a relationship with them? Could you give us some examples? Since I met um, my first farmer, Catherine Russell, seven years ago, um, my family has experienced sort of a sea change in the way that we eat and the way that we think about food. And back then, um, I would get a little bit of food here and there when it was convenient that was grown locally, but most of it was coming from the grocery store. Um, today, seven years later, we get anything that grows in Virginia 
um, at any time of the year, we are committed to eating seasonally and from Virginia growers. So for instance, I don't buy broccoli unless it's Virginia broccoli and I don't buy it in you know February because it doesn't grow then. I buy it when it grows. Um, you have to if you eat locally. So we've, um, in the summertime, my kitchen becomes <laughs> a big canning factory. The whole family's involved in um, getting the food together, putting it up. We've got a large freezer and we have a lot of cans. And so we really do think ahead about food. And we will get, we will get through to March or April until the food starts coming back in. And we will be craving that first piece of lettuce, <laughs> which is really an exciting thing. Um, the other thing is that my children understand that food is seasonal so that they can't have fresh peaches in February. They can have canned peaches and they can have peach jam and you know they're getting it. Um, they're starting to understand how seasons affect food. It's amazing how many children in America don't know what strawberry season is. <laughs> you know, they just don't even know there is a season. Um, the other thing that we do is I can't personally afford to buy meat, um, organically raised or uh, pastured meat p by the piece. But what I can afford to do is save my food budget and I, I buy directly from farmers. So I'll, I'll buy um, a, a quarter or a half of an animal or I'll split one with someone and um, then pay the butchering cost. And I can, you know, my per pound um, cost for this is very low. And then I have a freezer. So we eat from our freezer. and. All of our meat, when we're out in the, in the community, we eat vegetarian because we, if we don't know who raised the animals, then we don't eat meat. But the animals that we do eat, we know were raised ethically. They, were, um, they weren't given anything that we don't want to put in our bodies. <laughs> and they were also, um, you know, they were raised in humane, um, sustainable ways. So there, there are lots of, we are so fortunate here to be able to really source locally. If, if I could no longer buy any food from the grocery store, I would still eat well. I mean, we do get, in my family, bananas are an exotic. <laughs> you know, bananas and avocados, they come in occasionally and it's a big deal. But for the most part, um, you know, we eat here in Virginia. And, and that's a, you know, it's been a really, um, my children understand that food comes from farms. And, you know, they, they know that you go to farms to get food. And the other, the other thing I try to do, I, I totally support local businesses that sell f farming food, but these farmers are getting paid a fraction of the dollar for their food when they sell it and then it gets sold again. So whenever possible, I try to buy directly from farmers. And this means you know, developing a relationship with people who are often cranky and hard to get along with and elusive and, you know, and they're, but once, the thing about these farmers is they, their hearts are huge and once you build trust with them, um, they, they will really, you know, be there for you and, um, and I, I enjoy the bounty, you know, and, and I do things for them. I, they, they say jump and I say how high. I mean, when my farmers are in crisis, they know to call me because, you know, I'll help. And what I want to do with Friends of Farmers is create a whole kind of network of people who respond this way. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, farmers here, and, and what one of our farmers said today at the farm was, it's so good to know that people are there for you when you're living in this precarious, you know, hardworking way. So, You know, it, it occurs to me hearing you talk that another benefit of eating this way not only is the amazing taste difference, mm. which I haven't really heard you mention, but uh, I just, know it's there's there. There's no contest. <laughs> yeah. But it, when you think about it, you're going sort of back in history. Mm -hmm. And so the way that Thomas Jefferson ate mm -hmm. or, you know, our great-great-grandparents, you know, they didn't have access to oranges. I mean, an orange in yeah. a stocking exactly. at Christmas yeah. was a big deal. And it is for my children. I mean, they get oranges in their stocking and they're very excited. And they come from, my mother lives in Florida, so we bring yeah. them up here. So, but you know, the, the, the other thing that I didn't mention, a lot of people I hear talk about how it's too expensive to eat organically yeah. or to eat locally. and. I just don't believe it. Um, we're paying heavily for cheap food. We're paying in kind of other ways. But my family's food budget used to be 200 to $250 a week for groceries. I have a family of five. And, um, you know, I was buying good food, but not organic food. And now I spend 
maybe $50 a week. And sometimes I'll even go a month without going to the grocery store. And if you then factor in um, what I pay for the shares that I have, I have a, a CSA share, two of them actually. So I get... Yes. I'm sorry, CSA Community is... Supported Agriculture. These are um, farms where you buy a share in the farm and then you, you share the, the proceeds of the farm. So you pay up front for a season. So I have... Um, I'm Plowshare Community Farm is my vegetable CSA, and I get two shares from him, and then I have a milk share, three milk shares actually with Catherine Russell, and I have um, I buy meat from Joel Salatin at Polyface Farm, and then I get flour from Wade's Mill, and um, then I have other there are other producers, um, Henley's Orchard. I get all of my fruit from them, and if I put everything together that I spend on all these farms plus my family food budget my food budget has decreased by almost 40 percent mm -hmm. since I started eating locally. Now it's a lot of work, um, but in my mind it's a, it's a very fair trade, you know. So if I'm going to, I'm either going to go out and work for that money to pay to, you know, wreck the food system or <laughs> I'm going to go out and, and work myself. And they also teach me, I mean these farmers are so um, generous with their wisdom and they've taught me how to, I, we have chickens in our backyard because my one of my farmers taught me how to do that, and then I have a huge garden, and my CSA farmer is always coaching me, you know, and, and they're just, they're very generous with what they know, and, um, you know, they, they're, they're teaching me and my family how to live in a way that I couldn't have imagined, really, 10 years ago. You mentioned the hidden cost of cheap food. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on what some of those are? Well, just, just to take an example, um, if you buy strawberries in December in Virginia, those strawberries had to have come from, not even California, they ha they've had to have come from somewhere overseas. And so the strawberries get, and they're probably grown conventionally, so they're the, the amendments are hurting the soil, and then they're picked, and they're probably not picked in fair trade, so they're also hurting kind of um, ethical, you know, labor um, issues. And then they're put on a, an airplane and they're flown here, which is just a carbon nightmare. And then they're trucked across the country. And they're not ripe when they're picked because otherwise they'd be mush when they got to us. So at some point in this process, somebody sprays a hormone on them to quick ripen them. And by the time you get the strawberry, there's this whole chain of... Um, of mess, and it's almost um, when you when you compound this by packaging and um, just the, the the levels of changing hands, you know what we, you're left with is sort of a, a shadow of food. You know, I mean, right. food is life, and I have this little magnet on my refrigerator that says, "Food remembers the acts of hands and heart," and I. I believe that there is memory in the food, and what I've noticed since we've started eating locally, this food has grown with love and care, and it's grown with a lot of integrity. And the, the way this food feeds my family, I mean, it has, it has a higher nutritional value, but besides that, there's something else we're being given with this food. We're being given um, a connection to the land, the people, our community. We're being given a kind of, um, a way of honoring um, just the, the, the value of food itself and honoring ourselves, honoring our bodies. So I just think that um, the high cost of cheap food, the only reason we have cheap food in America is because we massively subsidize the industrial food system through our taxes. None of these subsidies are going to small farmers. And we're subsidizing the rape of the land. You know, we're subsidizing um, carbon catastrophe. We're subsidizing dead, tasteless food. And you know, this is just something that um, I'm no longer willing to participate in. I mean, my family, we really have, we have opted out of the industrial food system. And it's very liberating. <laughs> I mean, at first it was overwhelming and hard, and now it just feels, you know, like a big blessing to all of us. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I was really hoping that when Barack Obama announced his uh, pick for the Department of mm -hmm. Agriculture, yeah that it might even have been renamed the Department of Food yeah. to put that emphasis. This has been on. a hard one for local food people. Um, yeah. I'm, I, um, I, you know, I honor everything about this man. I worked hard for his election. 
I, you know, I've got his back. And, and I think we as Americans, we have got to have his back. Who wants this job? It's the worst job in the world right now. And, you know, part of what I'm doing with Friends of Farmers and with today is demonstrating to him that we are part of this. We're not expecting him to fix. We made this mess and we've got to clean it up, right? So, but at the same time, his ag pick was a big disappointment to um, food, people who care about food. Now, that being said, since then, um, we have been communicating a lot with the transition team and they have been listening. And I feel, and if you look at the um, change.gov site where people are registering their concerns and questions, um, the food related questions are creeping up the ladder. And it's really exciting because it means that there's this groundswell of response to, and I do think that um, President Obama, this is not in the center of his radar right now. You can't blame him. I mean, you know, right. but, but I think that um, there's a grassroots effort all over the country to bring food awareness kind of to the center of this administration's focus. And it even is, it's possible, not likely, that he will change his mind about that pick. Um, in any case, whether, you know, Vilsack is the, is the secretary or not, it doesn't really change our job, which is, again, a, a grassroots effort to undergird I want Central Virginia to be the go-to place for sustainable farming. I want people who are like, I want to start a farm somewhere, where should I live, to go, wow, I've heard that area around Charlottesville, they are, that is the place to farm. Those people really work at making you know, the farm life a good life for farmers. And these are people who will pay us a fair price for our food. These are people who will help us if we're in crisis. This is a community that doesn't just talk foodie, but is really radically committed to service with farmers. And if this is, if we can become a model community for um, rescuing the food system, then fantastic. You know, the other places can look to us for inspiration on how to do this. We've really, we're, we're way ahead of most communities already. Yes. So, you know, I think this is really the next step is to do something that is explicitly for farmers, that has farmers at the very center of what we're doing. And that's just practical. I mean, I talk to my farmers and they're like, yeah, well, those food, those food people are fine, but they're kind of wonky. And what I need is a tractor, <laughs> you know, or they'll say, yeah, to hell with that, get my greenhouse up. Like they're, they're dealing with the nitty gritty stuff every single day and they don't have time to sit around and kind of think theory, you know? So right. I would like to create a group that responds to those concrete needs, like today. We cleaned up that farm and that farm needed to be cleaned up. <laughs> so, you know, meetings don't get a farm cleaned up. So what kinds of help do you envision the organization that you're forming, Friends of Farmers, being able to offer? We want to offer, um, First of all, a service, practical service, a monthly or bi-monthly, what we did today, um, where farmers can call me and say, I've got to put up a deer fence, and they need 30 people. Or the alternative is they pay labor, and none of the farmers I know can pay for labor, honestly. I mean, th that is just completely out of their reach. So we offer labor to farmers. Um, secondly, I want to provide them with a, a kind of um, emergency fund so that if um, my friend Catherine lost her barn and immediately she needed a milker. She had 15 cows and no milker. So I bought her the milker, but there should be a, a group of people who has a slush fund for farmers in emergencies where we can say, okay, here's your milker, you know, and just get her through to the next, um, you know, the next step of solving her crisis. Um, I'd also like for us to provide seed money for new people. So I have a friend who has a little goat flock and she's kind of toying around with the idea of producing milk and cheese and a milk share. And I'd love to see her do this, but she's scared and she doesn't really have the capital she needs to take that little step to make it work. So I'd like for them to be able to, people who are, want, need some seed money to say to us, okay, here's what I want to do, and, and we say, great, and we give them just that little extra help they need to get off the ground. Um, and then finally, I want to be a resource for information, um, both about how to do this, how to do that, you know, how to, I have people call me all the time, how do I keep chickens in my backyard? You know, just a place where we can have a free information session seminars for how to do these things and, and kind of bolster farming, even backyard farming in our community, but um, also a place where farmers and consumers can find each other. Um, 
so that if Tony, my farmer, calls me like he did last summer and says I have 500 pounds of cabbage and I have to move it in three days because I'm calling my fields and I don't have room for it in my cold storage, instead of me trying to figure out what to do with 500 pounds of cabbage, and I'm like, ah, oh. you know, I have a, a group of people and I can say, we need to move this cabbage. And they can either buy it themselves or they can find people to buy it and, you know, we can help with that. Um, a really practical response to the needs of farmers. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know exactly how this will develop, but I know that it, it has to remain farmer-centered and um, it has to remain on the ground. So, you know, what I really need from people who are interested in doing this is, is just able bodies. And, you know, I, I don't want to do all the admin myself. I already run a few businesses and I'm kind of admined out. But, you know, people who can, whatever their gifts are, um, they can bring those gifts to the table and offer it to you know farms in this community. And I'd also love to see this take off and you know become an umbrella thing for local. Like you, you know you're not in Charlottesville, so right. you might take this idea to wherever you are. I mean I'm not proprietorial. <laughs> I just want to see it happen. So it sounds like a wonderful feedback loop. Uh, it sounds like the farmers will get what they need but what the participants get will be intangible. I oh. saw the, the kids out at the farm today and they were having a great time. Throwing frozen cow patties at each other, yeah. <laughs> Chasing the baby goats, you know, but they, they had a great time. And how many, how often do kids these days get to experience yeah. a farm? And I mean, that's, that's the stuff of life there. To me, food issues are um, kind of the great leveler. I mean, we. Democrats don't eat more than Republicans or vice versa and libertarians have to eat too. So I think Obama is making not just a sort of token effort but a really deep effort to kind of reach, make a huge tent, reach out across lines. And it's interesting for me because I'm a hardcore dyed-in-the-wool liberal with um, you know democratic roots that go back forever and my farmers, most of them are very conservative, um, personally and politically, or they're libertarian. And what I found is that when we, when we meet around a table, all of that disappears. Breaking bread, you know, sharing food with people, right. um, th these issues become, um, th the political differences become minor. And I'm hoping that in Charlottesville, we can do this. We can create a common table around this idea of food and good food. Um, you know, and remember that food is life. And we can meet each other here, you know, where the the uh, evangelical Christians and the you know the hippies and the commune dwellers and the CEOs all get together around a table and decide we are going to make farming work here. And politics are just not at that table. Thank you so much for your time today, Carol Ann. You've given us a lot to chew on. And now back to you, Michael. Thank you, Nancy, for that exciting story on this National Day of Service. And thank you for joining us for another Meet the Farmer TV. For additional information and extended versions of this program, visit our website, www.meetthefarmer.com. Meet the Farmer TV was made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified, Makia Video Productions, and Melly Productions, with additional support from the Blue Light Grill and Raw Bar, working closely with local farms, and Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture.